So good afternoon. Uh, recording uh, has start, so we can uh, also start our class of today. We uh, yesterday we introduced one important parameter of uh, thermal rocket, which is which is the uh, our thrust coefficient. We uh, introduced this parameter based on the expression that we have got for for trust of thermal rocket where we have only uh, let's say we have a clear dependence proportionality to the uh, pressure to the total pressure and to the, the trot area through a function of the expansion ratio of the ambient pressure and the uh, isotropic exponent or ratio of specific heat so we have introduced this proportionality factor that we have uh, is a non-dimensional quantity that we have called trust coefficient, which is defined as the ratio of trust to total pressure and the trot area. So this is the definition. We find that its expression is a function of PE over P0, gamma and PA over P0 in general, where we have also the pressure term that has to be considered and we have found that we can express this quantity as the adapted term uh, plus a contribution related to non-adaptation p0 p over p0 and the first term is, uh, uh, of course, the one related to the impulsive trust. And it's expressed in this way as a function, as I said, of gamma and of the pressure ratio. It's useful to recall that there is a direct relation between, in our ideal nozzle that we are studying, the isentropic flow, and that with the only drag potential, which is the area change, we have a direct relation between PE over P0 and Epsilon. And we have also written this uh, dependency of Epsilon as a function of gamma, and p over p0. So at the end of uh, yesterday class, we analyzed the behavior that we have for the trust coefficient. If we assume that uh, we have a given value of uh, the total pressure and the ambient pressure, or more precisely of this ratio, And the analysis that we have made is uh, to, to analyze, to, to show the behavior of the trust coefficient as a function of epsilon or e over t. That means also pe over p0. So it's like to say that we have, let's say something like this. As nozzle, and we have a given value of total pressure here, a given value of ambient pressure, and I'm looking to different length. I can stop the length here or here. I don't know where to stop. And so I'm analyzing what happens if I consider this length or this length or this length to, and to each of them, we have a corresponding area. So we can identify our uh, adaptation conditions. For instance, here we say that here we have PA. So PE equal PA means adapt and nozzle. And we, we look, look to the other solution corresponding to different values of uh, uh, exit area 
and in particular lower exit area means that PE is greater than PA, here PE is less than PA, and here of course we have that AE is less than A, let's say with this A we uh, identify the adapted condition, and here we have that A is greater than A. A. So if we uh, have seen that we have a maximum in this analysis for both the trust and the trust coefficient being constant P0 at T is the same, so what we see is that, for instance, for the trust, we, we found that uh, the F over the AE is positive when uh, we have PA, P, sorry, greater than PA, and less than zero when we, we have that P is less than PA. And so if we look to this uh, schematic that I've just drawn on the upper right, we see that PE greater than PA means AE less than AA, and the opposite here, AE greater than AA. So if we plot our trust as a function of the exit area, because we were analyzing this dependency, we find that it exists the adaptation condition A, A here, uh, where we have that uh, if the area is less than, is our AE is less than AA, we have growing trust if we have, we are in the condition of AE greater than AA, we are here, so it means that we have that the F, the AE is less than zero, we have a decreasing function, and so that we can identify our maximum that correspond to the adaptation condition. So we have a maximum of trust for varying uh, AE, or uh, more interesting, we find that we have a maximum of the trust coefficient. Why I say, uh, I say this? Because we can uh, translate the, the meaning. We are we are now considering just the, the the fact that this trust coefficient is proportional to trust, but it's proportional to trust as I wrote at the beginning through uh, this P zero a t. So if we have a higher value of CF, it means that for a given F, which is our target, recall, we uh, can obtain the same trust, if we have a higher uh, trust coefficient, it means that we have the same trust with a lower P0, AT. That means in some sense we can uh, consider that the weight of the engine would be uh, somewhat proportional to the pressure level that we have inside and to the size which is defined by this AT. So uh, in any case, having uh, increased this trust coefficient would allow us, if we are in the maximum of this trust coefficient, this would allow to, to save some, some weight. Okay, but we will comment later the meaning of the speed zero, and uh, and so we will uh, see it better in a moment. But for this analysis, we can make this general comment. Uh, now, uh, yes, we, we can also discuss this um, the behavior. Uh, so if these are the dimensional quantities, we can see 
uh, further comment on this uh, trust coefficient behavior. Now we put the corresponding dimensionless quantities. So for a given value of uh, um, P0 over PA, we have a given line with, um, let's say, some epsilon A and uh, uh, these two branches that uh, corresponds to the, the value that we have seen here. So we have on the left the region uh, where the exit area is less than the adaptation area. And so we have that the exit pressure is greater than the ambient pressure. So if this is true and you go back to the definition of underexpanded and overexpanded conditions, we are here in the underexpanded regime where PE is greater than PA. On the right branch, we are in the overexpanded condition. P less than PA. So what happens if uh, we consider now another value of P0 over PA? So this line corresponds to a given P0 PA, let's say one. Let's consider now P0 over PA2, which is such that P0 PA2 is greater than P0 PA1. Uh, what we find here is uh, rather, rather obvious that we will uh, cons we have a higher pressure ratio where we are in adapted conditions, so the, our adaptation epsilon will be found at a higher value of epsilon. So for instance here, at this position. This is because we have that P0 over PE in the adaptation condition is greater than in the former case. So P0 of, over PE greater means also a higher value of epsilon. And what will be the trust coefficient, the corresponding trust coefficient as compared to this one? So we, we have seen that the adapted trust coefficient is increasing with uh, the uh, area ratio or the expansion ratio uh, that you are considering. So we find that this value will be at uh, a higher, this new maximum will be at a higher trust value of trust coefficient. And if we now we can uh, draw the corresponding increasing, decreasing behavior that found this maximum, and then it's decreasing here, will be a line of this kind. And we can see also what happens to higher values what will happen, we will maximize later in terms of epsilon at higher epsilon and with a higher value of the trust coefficient. And of course, we can also draw in this plot this line, which is the one uh, line that we have already seen, which is the line corresponding to the adapted value of the trust coefficient. So these are all the adaptation points corresponding to different epsilon and to different values of P0 over PA with PA equal to P. It's also useful to uh, uh, see this maxima, maximum of the trust and trust coefficient uh, looking at the forces acting on the nozzle walls. Let's assume that we have again something like this. And 
let's consider now that, uh, for instance, this is the location where we have uh, our PA equal to PE. And let's see what are the forces acting on this wall. So if you look to pressure forces acting outside of the, of the nozzle, we can uh, uh, draw this say as forces acting in this direction, normal to the wall, and they are pushing towards the wall. This is from the atmosphere. Of course, this is the ambient pressure, so it's equal at all the positions. On the other end, we can also see the forces acting on the internal side and here we have some decreasing pressure, which is acting in this way. So this is useful because uh, in this way, in this uh, point, indicated here more or less at the middle of this uh, schematic, we have this black point that says that at this point we have P equal to PA. And so we see that on this branch here, on this part of the, of the nozzle, we have a resulting force in this direction due to the difference of pressure. That is, uh, resulting force is toward the external, uh, the external, so it is in this direction, and we have a positive component that will be this for the thrust. In the, if we consider now the part of the wall on the right of this black dot, we have that the resulting force in this case would be PA is greater than P, so we have a resulting force in this direction with a component, which is in the opposite direction with respect to thrust. So this part is pushing, this part is, is not, is, uh, is breaking our, uh, our uh, um, rocket. So let's consider uh, with respect to uh, a nozzle having exactly this length corresponding to this black dot, uh, if we add something on the right, so if we add this part, yeah, what happens? I'm just adding something which is reducing trust because we have only this negative contribution to trust that is added by this part. And what happens if I cut the nozzle with respect to this black dot? So I consider something shorter. I'm removing something, a part, which is contributing to trust because of the difference, the pressure difference would provide a, contrib a positive contribution to trust. So it's clear by this schematic that the optimum condition are thus corresponding to um, the adapted uh, exit pressure, so it means P equal to PA. Okay, so with this consideration, we can now uh, introduce another parameter. Uh, why? Because we have seen that, so with this we have described uh, more or less completely the uh, expression of trust, but we have also to analyze the behavior of specific impulse, and we have seen that in the specific impulse, we have to see at first the impulsive part and the part, I mean, the contribution to the impulsive, to the specific impulse corresponding to the impulsive part of trust, the jet thrust, uh, which is the exit velocity. 
that since the beginning, since for the first day, we are pushing, we are putting, sorry, attention to this uh, quantity. So you recall that this is square root to gamma, gamma minus one, RT zero, one minus PE over P zero, gamma minus one over gamma. So the difference with respect to the expression of the adapted or impulsive contribution of the trust coefficient is that we have this capital gamma here and that we have not in this case the term RT0 because we have seen that trust does not depend on the energetic content of the jet but only on the, our ability to uh, convert the uh, available energy in uh, kinetic energy. So the difference is mainly on this term. So the, it's useful to introduce another quantity that allows us to evaluate this contribution which is the energy level that we have available. And this is done, is done introducing a quantity that relates this uh, exhaust velocity to our trust coefficient uh, that, as this is a non-dimensional quantity, this is a velocity, it's a dimensional quantity, we can introduce a further parameter that we call C star, which is the characteristic velocity, and which is defined on the basis of something that can be measured to identify our uh, energy content. And uh, this definition will be P0 AT over dot M that I will see in a moment that in our ideal nozzle is directly related to this uh, RT0. So, this is an interesting quantity, this characteristic velocity. Because it includes all quantities that can be, let's say, more or less easily measurable. Uh, more than trust, for instance. And uh, in fact, Uh, consider, for instance, for trust, if you consider uh, the, the, the need of measuring trust of a solid rocket put in vertical direction, of course, you have to consider that you are measuring trust and weight, and weight is changing, and in principle, you don't know how it's changing. So, if you are not, uh, if you are not able to make an analysis before of the relation between trust and propellant consumption, and you don't know this, you are not able to separate trust and weight. So, for instance, trust could be difficult to, to be measured. So this is just a parenthesis. But here, what is interesting is that we can measure reasonably the, the total pressure in the chamber with a pressure, pressure transducer. We can be aware of the trot area, of course, by direct measure. And we can also measure uh, at least uh, in uh, in uh, liquid rocket engines this mass flow rate. So uh, in general, these are also interesting uh, quantities to be measured, and uh, this makes this definition particularly convenient. And we are always talking talking about thermal rockets. So if we uh, now go back to our uh, definition for uh, the ideal nozzle, we see that uh, we recall that we have defined our mass flow rate. We are considering always uh, chocolate flow. And we found this expression, and from here, 
we see that for this, for our ideal nozzle, there is a relation between our C star and just replace dot M here, and the, we, we cancel P0 at T, and we have square root RT0 over capital gamma. So, uh, So we can see that here we have exactly this square root of RT0. And so we see in particular that if we consider here UE over CF adapted, uh, we have exactly square root RT0 over gamma. Which is exactly a characteristic velocity. So we, we see that this is directly related to the energy content of the jet, and uh, can be measured. This definition is more general than uh, the second one. The second one is a result for the idea nozzle. This is a general definition. Okay, in general, we can define thrust coefficient R, F over P0, AT, and C star as P0, AT over dot M. These are two definitions, and then we can have these expressions. One is this one for C star, and the other one, at least this is just for the adapted condition, but we have also the other term. In general, the, also the pressure term, we have this expression that is valid for the ideal nozzle, but the definitions are more general for thermal rockets. And from these definitions, if I multiply CF and C star, the result is F of dot M, which is the specific impulse. So we see that we have identified two parameters, the thrust coefficient and characteristic velocity, that together contribute to specific impulse. And if we are aiming to get as high as possible specific impulses as we have discussed in the first uh, uh, weeks, what we see is that we would like to reach possibly high values of both these quantities so having high thrust coefficient is also interesting in terms of having, independently of thrust level, having high specific impulses. And this is true also for the characteristic velocity. So this is, of course, something that uh, is important to keep in mind also because we uh, have identified from one, one side the quality of the expansion through the thrust coefficient and on the other side the energy content which is related which is identified by our C star so in these quantities there is also let's say the 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 capability to exploit what we have available in the sense that, for instance, if you are eating something, we have a given power and we reach a certain level of entropy and, and thus total, total temperature. And uh, the C star tell us how much power, or let's say, yes, more identify this is related to the power that we are we have been able to bring into the expansion process and the trust coefficient tell us how much we are able to convert this in the kinetic energy through the expansion process so the trust coefficient identifies the quality of the, the expansion process the c star identify the quality of the 
energy that you have available. And for instance, it can be a measure if you are considering chemical rockets, can be a measure of the quality of combustion, for instance. Uh, it's also, we can, we can comment here, also in this expression of C star, uh, I don't remember if we already mentioned this aspect, but we can see it here directly in terms of C star, that uh, this is uh, 1 over gamma square root of R T0. Yes, I think we mentioned. So if we have that these quantities, let's say gamma T0 and them are in, were independent of each other, this is not the case, case of chemical rockets, but in general, they could be also imagined as independent and, and gamma related to the gas and T0 to the heating process, we see that we should desire high values of T0, low values of M, and also small values of gamma, as we have seen for with the relation with capital gamma. And uh, note that in this expression, we see that there is no nothing uh, related to the expansion process. So there is no dependency on uh, P0 over PE over the area, nothing about that. It's just the available content. So we have found these uh, features of our thermal rockets. Let's now see how they play a role in the uh, application of rockets. We see, so let, let's uh, continue to, to keep in mind that we have seen that for the uh, trust coefficient, we have a dependency on the uh, relation with the environment on, uh, let's say, the properties of the, of the rocket and the environment, the, the ambient pressure. We will uh, uh, talk later about, about our uh, characteristic velocity, will be uh, the core of uh, further discussion in the next classes. But here for the moment is something that is what we have available. Uh, so let's go back to our optimal conditions that we have found that for the trust coefficient will be the adapted uh, operating condition. So in principle, if this is the best that we can do, we should always work in adapted conditions. But this is not the case for our rocket or let's say is never, it's more or less never the case for, for our rocket. They do not work in adapted conditions. So let's see why. We have two uh, kind of applications of rockets. One is that of uh, launchers and another one is that of, uh, let's say, um, trusters for uh, the, the the generation of thrust outside of the atmosphere, that means in spacecraft uh, thrusters or rockets that uh, will operate in vacuum outside of the atmosphere. So what we don't have is in this application, so we have launchers which operate in the atmosphere, at least for the first stage, and you have spacecrafts. So we use our rockets in these two applications. In this one, we have that for the first stage, we have a changing PA, changing pressure level, 
uh, in the next stages, if we have, uh, typically we are already in an air vacuum conditions. So this, yeah, the presence of this pressure mainly applies to first stages. In spacecraft, we are operating in vacuum. So the application we don't see is that of operating at constant pressure. So in the launcher's application, it's not possible to have something. So if we consider, we have to precise something. If we consider a constant chamber pressure, we cannot imagine something which is always adapted. There will be, there can be a single instant of adaptation and then in all other conditions, if pre ambient pressure is changing because of uh, the rocket motion, there will be never exactly the same um, adapted conditions. If you are uh, in vacuum, application to upper stages of spacecrafts, what we see is that our pressure, ambient pressure is more or less zero. And uh, saying that the ambient pressure is zero. If we wish to adapt to that pressure, we should expand up to roughly press zero pressure. That means uh, this can be obtained, as we have seen, by the, uh, let's say, if PA go to zero, it means that adaptation implies that PE go to zero, and this is equivalent to say that epsilon goes to infinity. And of course, infinity is, not in, is, is something that cannot be uh, realized. So what we do, let's start with the second case where we have no role of um, of atmospheric pressure because we are in the vacuum. So let's look to vacuum. Operation. So we assume that PA can be considered zero so that we have our trust coefficient which is the adapted one, plus epsilon p over p0. We see that this is only a function of p, p0, and epsilon we can plot uh, this uh, truss coefficient as a function of epsilon. And we see that if this is the adapted one, we find that we have something which is always greater. Our vacuum trust coefficient is always greater than the adapted one by this quantity. And this is a quantity that will be uh, larger when we have a higher values of P over P0. When, when we move towards the, uh, the higher value of epsilon, this P over P0 is nearly zero, goes to zero more rapidly than epsilon goes to infinity. And so we can see that this uh, this difference is reducing. We recall also that our vacuum uh, trust coefficient uh, depends on epsilon, uh, sorry, on gamma with uh, higher values corresponding to lower gamma. 
So if this is the case for our task coefficient, we should move, as we said, towards the maximum trust coefficient that correspond to adaptation at vacuum, so epsilon that goes to infinity. This is not practical. And uh, what we, we can say for, uh, for this vacuum operation, what could be convenient? So the, the message is that in terms of trust coefficient, we should move towards the higher expansion ratio, the higher error ratio possible that can be realized. But we have to be careful because we see that we have an asymptotic value of this trust uh, coefficient. And so it means that at a given point, the, let's say that the improvement of performance is uh, less and less significant as we move towards the, the, the asymptotic value, as we move towards high error ratio. So, and what is the, where is the, the trade-off? Where is the, uh, the condition that tell us when we should uh, stop in considering higher and higher area ratios. We can say for sure one, uh, one uh, consideration is based on the saving of propellant mass that we can obtain by considering a high thrust coefficients. So we have seen that for a given star, we can in increase the specific impulse through an increase of trust coefficient. So we are interested to move in this direction because we can improve our specific impulse. But why would we like to improve the specific impulse? Because with the increase in increasing specific impulse, we save propellant mass. But of course, if we realize longer and longer uh, nozzles, we are also increasing weight. We are increasing the mass of our thruster. And so there will be a moment when we reach the condition that we save less propellant than the mass we are adding to get higher thrust coefficient. And this will be for sure a point of uh, Let's say of trade-off uh, of uh, that will stop us uh, in terms of maximum uh, area ratio reached, but we have also to consider that then this will depend on the application, and then we have a finite room available. For instance, in our payload bay within uh, the the launcher, or if you are talking about an upper stage, we have a size of the stage that is allowable, not more. And of course, we have to consider that if we move towards higher uh, area ratio, we should increase not only the engine mass, but also other masses. So the saving of propellant becomes uh, more uh, important that uh, in the sense that if we don't save enough propellant, the increase of other masses is no longer justified. So in general, we try to get an optimum um, area ratio, and this is for uh, space application. So for spacecraft rate are high, uh, of course, it depends on the general size of the, the engine. If we have a small engine, probably we can uh, more easily consider a high um, area ratio. And we, we can also find something, let's say, typically can be greater than 100, and we can reach up to about 400 for some particular case. Uh, final further comment on, on this. Uh, we see that in this expression, And as a consequence, on the specific impulse, we have no explicit dependence on this total pressure. The important quantity in vacuum 
let's ignore all of this on this expression, but only of the P0 PE, which is related to epsilon. So we see that here in this case, we have that our specific impulse is related to our uh, characteristic velocity and to uh, the expansion ratio. No effect of the P0, which appear in the thrust coefficient actually if you are considering stages or engines operating in the atmosphere. So we will continue uh, in 10 minutes uh, talking about the other application, which is launcher or first stage operation. So we make a 10 minutes break. Professore, scusi, posso fare una domanda? Certo. E riguarda uno degli esercizi che ha caricato su e-learning, eh, il secondo sui veicoli multistadio, perché c'è la seconda domanda che chiede ehm, vengono aggiunti due booster al nostro lanciatore bistadio e chiede di fornire lo stesso delta V ha una massa di carico utile maggiore di 1780 kg e calcolare il contributo di ciascun sottorazzo al delta V totale. Eh, ho due domande in verità. La prima è di interpretazione del testo. Cioè, qui ci sta dicendo che il carico utile non lo conosciamo, ma è sicuramente maggiore di 1780 kg o è 1780 kg più alto di quello che abbiamo trovato prima? Allora, un attimo che mi guardo il testo direttamente. Ok. Allora, esercizio su veicoli multistadio, giusto? Eh, sì, il secondo. Il secondo. Mm. Allora, lanciatore più stadio, quante caratteristiche? Il primo stadio, massa inerte, la quantità di propellente totale. Sì, allora stiamo dicendo che nel secondo caso eh, possiamo, andiamo a vedere che possiamo ottenere lo stesso delta V, ma riusciamo a considerare una massa di carico utile maggiore. Questa è una tipica applicazione che facciamo, diciamo così, la presenza di booster permette una maggiore versatilità del lanciatore proprio perché magari mettendoli oppure no, si riescono a ottenere masse di carico utile maggiori eh, o minori in orbita. Quindi, allora la domanda era, nel secondo caso vogliamo eh, considerare lo stesso delta V, ma eh, diciamo così diventa la nostra incognita il carico utile. Ok, grazie. E quindi uh, se l'incognita è il carico utile, io cioè, avevo trovato un'espressione però mh, non riuscivo a risolverla se non numericamente. Mh, è possibile questo? Sicuramente c'è un modo anche analitico. 
perché avendo solo il delta V totale mi veniva poi un'espressione in cui mi compariva come incognita solo il carico utile, però eh, diciamo era un'equazione non, non lineare, cioè non, non si riusciva a esplicitare. Diciamo che, che in questo momento non ho la soluzione davanti e, e quindi eh, non ricordo i dettagli, dovrei fare l'esercizio, ehm, però direi che a ah, occhio si dovrebbe poter fare analiticamente. Ok, la ringrazio. Però diciamo così, se dovesse essere contrario, venerdì ve lo dico. Ok, grazie. Prego.
So we can start about the exercise uh, that uh, I was asked about uh, for the multi-stage. The second exercise, I will show you. Uh, I will describe you how to proceed uh, in the next practice on uh, Friday because I understand that uh, it's not straightforward and uh, uh, I think that uh, probably we need some iteration. And so it's not uh, found in a closed form, the solution. Uh, we go back here. We were talking about uh, launcher operation. Uh, we are considering that uh, we should consider here the fact that there is change of atmospheric pressure with altitude and we suppose that we are changing altitude. We, we don't expect we are working in the atmosphere at constant altitude. So as a first uh, analysis, we can imagine to work with uh, a constant total pressure and with a fixed geometry, which is not something strange. It's the most common way of operating a first stage. So what happens to our thrust coefficient? We, have, we should consider altitude and we know that pressure, ambient pressure uh, is increasing in this direction and is decreasing with altitude. So uh, how will uh, the thrust coefficient change? with altitude. So saying that uh, if we look to the change of ambient um, pressure and which is decreasing and we can consider for a given value here we know, for instance, of course we have a given value of P0 and we, we start with this value of atmospheric pressure which is the sea level one, we have a thrust coefficient at sea level and we can imagine to have adapted uh, nozzle here at sea level. So we can, uh, if we consider the adapted thrust coefficient moving towards value of P0 over PA, which are increasing, is exactly the same that we have seen before in terms of dependency on epsilon. So actually, we have a line that corresponds here to an ideal always adapted nozzle that starts from this sea level value and then continues to increase towards the maximum thrust coefficient. But if we have a constant uh, exit area, so we have a constant P0 over PE, we will work in under-expanded condition all along the trajectory. And in this under-expanded condition, we will always show thrust coefficient, which is less than the adapted one up to reach asymptotically a value which is our vacuum thrust coefficient corresponding to this the area ratio that allow us to have adapted conditions at sea level. So what we see here is that we find um, that in principle we are wasting something, we are not exploiting uh, what is in theory possible uh, because we have uh, just adapted at this condition and we are always below the maximum thrust coefficient that can be obtained with that pressure at that altitude. So what we can do to improve our performance? Of course, it depends also on the kind of stage you are considering. Uh, how long is operating at which altitude? So if it's operating in vacuum for most of its time as the core stage of uh, a launcher like uh, uh, 
the, the future SLS or the Space Shuttle or uh, uh, the Ariane 5. So if they spend most of time in early vacuum conditions, we should adapt, optimize the performance in that range rather than at sea level. Uh, in general, we could have uh, two options available. One is that of changing the, the pressure level as we move with altitude. And uh, another one is to, or, or changing the pressure level here, also at sea level, so that we start from, let's say, an area ratio larger. Or we, we can also imagine to work in overexpanded condition at sea level and try to adapt rather than at sea level at a higher altitude. So in the first case, changing uh, the pressure P0 towards higher values, we just consider that uh, in this case, we have this behavior reaching at a given at a point. Let's say we have we reach this vacuum value, which is a function of epsilon. And if we start here, that means we are uh, going to consider. Uh, higher uh, total pressure we will reach a higher value also in vacuum because we have again same function and we have a higher higher ratio that comes from the fact that here at the same ambient pressure we have a higher total pressure so this allows us to improve the value of trust coefficient all along the trajectory. We, we have to consider also the uh, always adapted line that would be something greater here. And we've crossed the given point and here, but these two lines we reach both the same CF max value. The other option, another option, is that of uh, getting a higher trust coefficient, considering that this is the adapted trust coefficient, rather than adapting here as we have just shown, that it was this line. Let's do it in this way to make it clearer. We can adapt at this altitude to get something like this. So what we do? We improve our uh, trust coefficient in this region from the adaptation point on. Of course, we are uh, in a worst condition uh, in this part here, where we are below the, 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 the case where we have adaptation, uh, adaptation at sea level. This will be adapted at altitude. So this is another option that uh, could be of uh, interest. And we are always talking about something uh, related to the fact that P0 is constant. That's a typical operation and that uh, uh, will be uh, what we will consider in most of our analysis.
So what we see here is that in general, if we consider the vacuum case before and then also this case here, we can say that the our nozzle will almost always operate in under-expanded condition. However, there is, for this reason here, the interest of working in over-expanded conditions here in this range of altitudes to improve the performance along most of the trajectory. And uh, so this is something that will be only related to first stages. So before uh, going in more depth here to, to make some further comment, let's recall what happens in uh, our overexpanded and underexpanded condition at the exit of the nozzle. Let's consider some, let's say some, some sim something simple that we have a number greater than one here. Under expanded condition, as we have seen, we have centered expansion. Hmm? Something like this. We have an expansion at the exit, and my expansion like this. Then reflect as compression and jet change curvature here. And we go, uh, this bit can become a shock. And then this will be reflected as an expansion here. We have a further expansion. Something like this. And what happens? Uh, so, what we see in uh, the real case is jet that becomes larger than the, the, the nozzle uh, just after the, the exit and then uh, continues with a series of uh, expansion and compressions. Actually, there will be also some three dimensional effect. This is more or less planar in case of. Uh, uh, three dimensional flows, there will be also barrel shocks, and in practice, what we see is something like uh, a MAC disk here. And uh, reflected shocks, and this will be repeated many times around the jet and in, in the this part there will be always let's say this is the jet boundary Something like this. This will be in the actual jet that we have. Your expansion here and here and here and here and here. So more or less, this will be the shape of the of an underexpanded jet. What happens in case of overexpanded jet? So. We have seen that we have different regimes and we have seen with uh, one dimensional theory that we can have, uh, let's say we, we identify the, the, the regime with uh, a shock inside the, the nozzle with uh, no longer as a tropic solution and another uh, range of ambient pressure such that we have this condition 
So we are between the pressure level that corresponds to the supersonic adapted condition and the condition with normal shock at the exit. If pressure is greater than this P and S, there will be a shock inside. If uh, the pre ambient pressure is in this range, we have uh, in principle something different. We, we don't know. We, we say that it's overexpanded. We have no longer shock inside. So what means we have no longer shock inside? It means that we are in conditions similar to uh, this one above of the under-expanded case, except that instead of having expansion, we should have compression. Let's consider our supersonic jet here. We are at a pressure which is lower than the ambient, and we will have that we have to increase pressure through shocks. And what happens here? It happens something that is similar to what we find here from a given point on in this uh, underexpanded jet. After expanding, we have a compression. And so we start here in this case with a compression, and then we continue with expansion and compression, and so on. So this will be more or less what happens in case of overexpanded jet. Overexpanded in this range. Now, we, we should make some consideration to the fact that here I'm looking to something which is uh, multidimensional multi compared to what we were, expected, were expecting before as the, um, let's say, 1D solution. So if we consider this case here with PA equal to P and S, Actually, what happens is that in the 1D case, we expect to have a shock like this, whereas in the multidimensional case, we expect to have a shock like this, the one we have seen here. So this is important also to understand what happens that allow us to move from a solution that overexpanded jet with the shock outside of the nozzle and what happens when we are at pressure higher than this PNS that moves the shock inside the nozzle. Uh, a comment that can be done here is that if we are in this condition with the shock outside, all the, the flow inside the, the nozzle is not affected by the ambient pressure. So, as in the case of under-expanded condition, we have that forces are the same inside the, the rocket. The, the difference that we have for different ambient conditions are related to the difference in terms of the ambient pressure that has to be considered in the overall balance of forces. So, in both overexpanded and underexpanded condition, if we have this flow, which is uh, shown here, is uh, fully attached within, we have fully attached is too much, we say, uh, it's more correct to say, we have this one dimensional solution up to the exit condition here, corresponding to isentropic flow, supersonic isentropic flow, uh, nothing changes inside. We just have these changes of PA that uh, correct our our uh, thrust coefficient value. Uh, the, the, what changes is when we move towards uh, the solutions 
or the, the operating conditions with uh, the shock inside the nozzle. In the, uh, the one-dimensional case, we say at a given point we have a shock here, normal shock. And we have found that there can be a balance that allows us to, to find such a solution, such a non-isentropic solution corresponding to a given, given value of the um, ambient uh, pressure. In the real case, uh, we have to, let's say, uh, enlarge what happens here, and we should consider that actually what we have at the exit is a boundary layer. It's not only a supersonic jet, but we have something like this. In general, we may have a shock. Let's consider this shock here. And we have that it vanishes inside this boundary layer. Here we have supersonic flow, and here we have some subsonic flow within the boundary layer. So if we have here a higher pressure and here a lower pressure, what happens that this is uh, okay adjusted through the shock in the supersonic range, whereas in the subsonic region there is no shock and there is, let's say, an effect of this pressure that pushes the flow uh, towards this direction and so it slows down the subsonic flow uh, that will occupy a larger area. In practice what we see is that because of this higher pressure we have a thickening of the boundary layer here. Let's say it becomes uh, something like this, and for the supersonic flow, there will be an obstacle that must be considered that will yield, let's say, a new shock like this, a brick shock, even before of this one. So the complex structure will occur that uh, is something like lambda shock that. Uh, will be typical uh, way we originate this kind of, uh, of structure. This is in principle if we have this shot in this way, but something can be different. And the difference can come from the fact that if this difference of pressure is high enough, the flow can detach from the wall. We can have flow separation. So separation is a phenomenon that occurs when we have an adverse pressure gradient. So pressure is increasing against the flow direction, that in this case is this one. And uh, of course, pressure is trying to slow down the flow because of course we have this force that opposes to the flow. Uh, movement, the flow momentum. So depending on the pressure gradient, what can happen is the following. We have, this is with zero gradient, we have this kind of boundary layer. With increasing gradient, we have a higher effect when the momentum is less close to the wall. Pressure is more or less uh, constant within the boundary layer. So if we have uh, this uh, adverse pressure gradient, we start to see something like this for the boundary layer that uh, shrinks the boundary layer close to the wall, something that becomes also, uh, you see, uh, thinner here up to a point where we have that the force reverse the flow, the pressure force. That means that it becomes something like this. We still have 
the main flow in this direction, but at war we start to have a flow uh, in the reverse direction. So this happens when we have strong pressure gradients. And here, in our case, this pressure gradients comes from the, the shock. And the shock, you know, is a local strong pressure gradient. Of course, this pressure gradient will also depend on the pressure difference that we have through the shock. That means to the shock uh, strength. So let's uh, uh, go back to this scheme here. And start from the from the case when we have ideally the supersonic jet here and adapted condition. So what happens in this case is that the flow has not to change its pressure and uh, its uh, uh, direction because we have exactly the same pressure. So if we increase Let's now see what happens if I increase, sorry, increase ambient pressure. We will have that for a, a small amount of this increase, we'll have a weak shock here that will originate and the flow will be slightly uh, change its direction because of this small increase of ambient pressure. As we further increase this ambient pressure, the strength of this shock will increase and we will move towards higher and higher shocks. This is shock one, shock two, shock three. It's not an expansion front. Don't make confusion here. These are different shocks due to the increasing ambient pressure. And uh, the strength of this shock is, of course, as you can go to the relations of the oblique shocks, and you can easily see that here we are increasing, of course, the where by definition we have that the shocks are generated by a higher pressure ratio, a higher pressure difference uh, between this PE and the PA. And uh, at a given point, this pressure difference that is, uh, of course, also the pressure difference to the shock will be higher and higher. And there will be a, a point such that we have a uh, we, go, we reach this condition, that means that we have flow separation. Now, flow separation here does not show, is not this the, the best uh, schematic to, to analyze flow separation, because we have to keep in mind that if we move inside the nozzle, pressure is changing. Whereas in this case, this is an ideal case where we have uh, constant cross section with just for to examine what happens outside. So if we we would like now to consider our real or let's say closer to the condition as this one. So we have separation uh, and uh, separation is found experimentally to occur when we we exceed a given threshold. So we have, let's say, an ambient pressure such that we have separation. So we have separation if the ambient pressure over the exit pressure is greater than this value that we will refer to as pi separation. So, of course, the, the important ratio is the ratio between these two pressures. And if the ambient pressure is greater enough 
than the exit pressure. So if we have that this ratio is greater than our pi here, we have flow separation. So once we have flow separation, uh, we'll have something like uh, this, that at a given point flow detaches from the wall. And here we have a shock. Uh, actually, what happens is also that here we have some of the circulations. So we have, because of the gradient, we have uh, flow detachment, separation, and this shock that is moved in a position inside the nodes. Why we have this position? Why we have found some equilibrium condition? Because as we move inside the shock, of course, what happens is that our it's like our PE is changing and actually is increasing. So at a given point, we go below this condition. And there will be a position where we have exactly this ratio. So if we start, if we have a condition here with PA over PE greater than pi sep, what happens is that we have a position X here such that because Px is greater than Pe, we have reached the condition that Pa over Px is equal to pi separation. And this will be the new equilibrium condition. If you change your Pa, so your Pa over Px, you will move in a different position here where you find the equilibrium condition. So let's uh, consider now. So we are talking about the overexpanded operation, and we have found that uh, there is uh, the possibility that flow separation occur, and this would justify the way that we can have by increasing ambient pressure a shock inside the nozzle that could be like this, that becomes similar to what we uh, can imagine in our one dimensional solution with the shock, which is something like this. Uh, so if you look to what happens here at the wall. You know, we, we were seeing something uh, like this with our exit pressure. This is our PE or P soup. We call it also in this way. And uh, we have P here and X in this direction. And uh, what we find is that if I look at the wall, there will be, well, there is not a shock exactly at the wall. There will be that kind of behavior that you mentioned before, because there is this thickening of the boundary layer and uh, detachment of the flow. So there will be something like this. The interesting uh, feature that I like to highlight here is that we have now uh, with this detachment, we have a uh, dead water region here where we have some recirculation, but more or less, as we have flow detachment here, we have more or less the ambient pressure. So, in fact, we are talking about something that, as here, our <coughs> PA over PX equal to pi z. That means that here, more or less, this is a region where we have uh, ambient pressure. And this, this one also shown here. So what is the comment that we can make about that? 
and we will be back on this in a minute, is that here this part of the, the nozzle doesn't, doesn't play a role here. It's not like in the overexpanded condition before uh, this flow detachment when we have that this part is contributing negatively to trust. Here we have that ambient pressure on both sides. So this is more or less uh, zero contributing to uh, trust. It's not neutral, this part of uh, the nozzle. So before doing this, I'd uh, like also to mention that this pi here is a quantity, of course, of interest because we should know when we have flow separation or we don't. And uh, this has been uh, evaluated with different criteria. One of them is the known summer field criterion. that uh, says that our pi is about its value between three and four. That means that the ambient pressure must be three to four times greater than the exit pressure to have this flow uh, detachment. And uh, uh, so this is the detachment conditions and this also we see it's uh, inverts this uh, seen also as PE over PA that corresponds to, of course, 2.5, 0.33. Mm. That is the same, of course, it's just the inverse, it's just one over pi. Uh, so we can consider that uh, we have this full flow without detachment up to uh, pressure and exit pressure, which is one fourth of the uh, ambient pressure. Uh, the, the criterion has been developed starting from conical nozzles, and then, of course, there are other criteria related to different nozzle shapes. And uh, the, the original one was uh, of uh, Summerfield criterion, was developed for uh, 15 degree. Uh, opening uh, uh, conical nozzles uh, with uh, for and for them there was this PE over PA was the criterion was P over PA about 0.4 or a pi of 2.5 but this value has been found also larger for uh, the common nozzle of interest. Um, so if we apply now this criterion to uh, the evaluation of trust coefficient, we should take into account what we uh, were mentioning just a moment before. So recall, we were looking to the behavior of trust coefficient as a function of uh, epsilon of the area ratio for a given value of total to ambient pressure ratio. So we consider our uh, uh, variation of epsilon, that means moving in this direction, different value of epsilon, can, that correspond to different length, so different area ratio of this nozzle. And this is what we see in this plot for a given uh, P0 over PA, and we have seen that we have something like uh, like this, right? With a maximum value that corresponds to this epsilon. This is what you've seen just a few minutes ago and this maximum class coefficient. So this is the, let's assume that this is this uh, epsilon A. And so what happens here is that in all this part, we have that PE is greater than PA. So this is the part corresponding to under-expanded condition. 
and this is the overexpanded condition if we consider all the other area ratios. But here we can identify, uh, so we have, we have PE less than PA, but we can identify another point that corresponds to the condition such that PA over PE, so here PA is greater than P and it's increasing, and here we assume it's equal to our pi uh, corresponding to separation. So here we have the overexpanded condition, and here we have overexpanded plus separation, plus flow separation. So we have already analyzed what happens up to this point. And we can identify, for instance, this point here in this plot. So what happens at this point when we have this flow detachment? As I mentioned, we have here, there will be, let's say, something like this as the separation line. And more or less here, what we have is that pressure is about ambient pressure. So for all these other positions, I'm adding something here, this part of the wall, where pressure is the same on both sides. So we have that uh, this part is neutral. So actually, we continue to add parts that do not change the value of thrust. So here I should assume that because of flow separation, we stop decreasing our thrust coefficient, and it will remain at this fixed value. So, we, and this is, let's say, a kind of uh, adaptation to the ambient pressure of the jet. The jet expands up to a given value. Then it does not longer change. Of course, you have to consider that all this branch is overexpanded. So this is contributing negatively to thrust because we have that pressure is lower than the ambient. And this is why we are below the maximum value. We have also to, to say that in the real world, there will be some uh, motion here that tell us that pressure is slightly less than the ambient. So here, actually, we have something that will slightly decrease. And so we can uh, see, like just to show this picture, and then I will stop. So we see. This kind of plot where we have, these are exactly the, the plot I was doing before with this dashed line that corresponds to separation, and this is with pi equal to 3, if I remember well. And uh, so we can consider that, for instance, here instead, if I'm moving on this line, on this red line, I will have to consider that instead of going here up to this red dot that we see at this point, for instance, for this epsilon, this uh, brown line corresponds to given epsilon, I will find actually something better because of this kind of adaptation due to flow separation. And uh, what is this, uh, this brown line that uh, uh, I highlighted here? is that if we uh, move along our ascending trajectory, uh, what happens is that we have a constant total pressure and a decreasing ambient pressure. So we are increasing our value of P0 over PA. So I'm moving from one line to another one of this for a given value of area ratio, which is fixed. So I'm moving along this 
brown line and in particular I'm moving towards higher values. So you see that of course decreasing in pressure in this direction, so decreasing in is in the opposite direction. And in particular here, if I start from this separated flow condition, highly overexpanded, I will move in this direction to reach an adaptation value up to the condition corresponding. Of course, I will stop here when I reach ambient pressure equal to zero. So uh, PC over PA tends to infinity. That will be the uh, vacuum conditions. So you see in this plot, we, we see that at the left of the dashed line, we are we have uh, just summarize we have the underexpanded condition here between this dashed line and this other line here we have the overexpanded condition without separation and here below this line where we have this dashed uh, CF lines we are in the separated flow separated overexpanded flow. Uh, this plot tell us much about the behavior of uh, the class coefficient. I will. Uh, uh, I have to say just uh, a final word about flow separation. Flow separation is typically something that is difficult to control. Is actually we have uh, pressure oscillations here in this separated area that makes also this point fluctuates. And uh, if uh, the gradient is not so high in this part of the, the nozzle, the, the oscillation can be large and can be different at different uh, azimuthal positions. And this will uh, generate some unbalance in radial direction. That means that we have also component of forces which are not axial, but are in the, uh, as I mentioned, the, the radial direction. And this uh, is what uh, is referred to as side loads. Uh, which is a, an undesired phenomenon that is usually uh, we require that it has to be avoided. And this is the reason why we start actually from this line. From this line here. We don't go further. So we avoid to work in separated conditions, also at sea level. And uh, we consider over expansion if you like to adapt at altitude, but we start from here. We don't go in the uh, over expanded condition with flow separation to avoid the possible occurrence of uh, silos. So I'll stop here today.